Hello and welcome to another episode of Agility on the Ear. Today we have the great opportunity to hear the agility life story of an international agility star from Norway as today's episode will be in English. She started to run agility about 17 years ago with her mom's mixed breed. As a nine-year-old girl, her grandparents bought a Sheltie so that she could have her own dog to train as well. From 2005, Nikki became her training buddy, and in 2011, she bought her own Sheltie from her savings named Key. With him, she participated at JEO 2014, EO 2014, EO 2015, went there on the eighth place in final and competed in the World Championship 2015. In 2015, she got We, her dream Sheltie. With him, she experienced big moments, participated at AWC several times and won gold in jumping in 2018. In 2019, they won gold in both Nordic championships. That year, Norway, unfortunately, was not allowed at the AWC, but this was really his best year. 2021, they won gold medal in team competition at the Nordic Championship. After we, she had Chichi, qualified to Class 3, but never got the chance to take out his potential. In 2020, she expanded her pack with Little Jet and Mini Sheltie with a big attitude. Beside agility, she have a bachelor degree in global nutrition, but have since 2018 lived of working with agility. Hello and welcome, Ina Himmler. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Glad you accept the invitation. So, take us with you on your way. How did you get your first stock? Oh, well, my parents both um, ran agility at the time. So my, my father was running with a German Shepherd and my mom with a, a mixed breed, Border Cooling. Uh, and I followed them to competitions and were, really wanted to run myself. So every time I cried and cried to get uh, to run with uh, my mom's dog and sometimes she left me, but um, she really thought that it was too hard for me. So then I uh, continued to to beg my grandparents to buy uh, a Sheltie. And uh, eventually I got my will. So when I was nine years old, they bought a Sheltie, Sheltie that named Nikki, as you said. And I started to train with her. And how did you start then to train your first dog? So your parents take you with on the training's place? Yes, my father actually had uh, a old place. Uh, and was a trainer, a dog trainer at that time. So I trained at that place, but I didn't want any help from my parents, of course, like every other children. Yeah. <laughs> so I really did most of it by, by myself. And of course, uh, this, is, this is many, many years ago. So uh, the foundation training was, of course, really different. So uh, the main focus was to teach the obstacles and then you just ran and show the dog where to go. And um, she was really stubborn and I was really stubborn. So it was a bad combination in the, in the beginning. Uh, so we had our, yeah, it was some ups and downs. So when we started to compete, when she was 12 months, because that was the age at that time, uh, she almost always ran out of the course to say hello to other people instead of running with me. And then she came back and ran. And uh, if she didn't do that, she just, uh, when I took off the leash, she just ran and took every obstacle she wanted <laughs> before <laughs> she wanted to listen to me. So it was really frustrating. Uh, and I was not consequent with the sit and stay and stuff. So it took me quite many years until I started to be consequent with her and got her up in a great tree and competed the Norwegian championship with her. So my parents live, uh, we moved at the time when she was around five years old. So then I actually traveled with the train uh, to this place on the other side of Norway 
to pick her up uh, one weekend and had her for two weeks. And then I traveled with a train like it was like a trip on eight hours oh, wow. uh, back two weeks later to uh, deliver her back to my grandparents. So, um, yes, it was a bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And how did you find then the way to get her to get her like focused on the work? A uh, good question. I think uh, maybe better rewards was uh, one of the one of it, and I think also her growing up and me growing up just being more consequent, giving her a reward when everything was good, not yelling at her if she ran away. And uh, helping her to understand was the way to to get to build up our teamwork. Let's go a little bit more deep to the rewards. How do you develop your rewards in comparison from the past to now? Oh, from the past, uh, with her, it was only mainly only treats. Uh, so only a treat, yeah, good dog and a treat, nothing more than that. Uh, so the treat itself was the reward. Now I really like that the rewards are something bigger. It's, it's more it's more of the joy and the teamwork around it. So uh, if I reward with treats, of course, I can also just give it to the dog. But um, my dogs are not that super happy with treats. So if I uh, want to reward them with treats, normally I have to... Um, bring some joy to it, give more treats, let them chase the treats and or throw it on the floor or yeah, bring some movement into it. But normally I like to use toys. So either tugging, my dogs love tugging, uh, but also chasing, chasing toy and let them just run around with them, uh, uh, run around with it uh, themselves. Um, I don't normally use ball that much because they are a bit crazy. So when I throw it, they just look at the ball and don't see where they run. Mm. <laughs> so then they will get injured. So uh, now I really like tugging. Yes. Okay. And how when did then after this dog with the train, you were going for a journey to train something and back? One how it time. went on after, how it went on yeah after uh, with my first dog yes yes um after that uh, i wanted my own dog because this was my parents dog so i wanted uh, to buy my own dog so i started to save money and when i was 15 i got enough uh, so i bought a key so he was my first own dog. And um, as a 15-year-old girl, I uh, called around to breeders to hear if they had uh, x-rayed the, uh, the Shelties. That was not normal at that time. So it really was hard to find a breeder that um, did those health uh, tests. So when I first found him, I was really happy. And he was a really good learning dog. I was still very young. So he was not super crazy or super fast, but just did what I asked him to do. Of course, he was stubborn in his way, but not the fastest one. So uh, he was um, a really good starting dog for me. I think he was perfect. And what did you change in your trainings with him? I think with him, I got him in 2011. And I, I don't know, but especially for me it was like uh, doing those first years with him um, I think the agility uh, turned really uh, to the better side so the foundations started to come uh, but in the beginning with him it was still the old way uh, I didn't know much I was young and I uh, I didn't take any classes, so I learned everything from YouTube. And um, so, the, so the foundation work was a bit old, old-fashioned still, but with some uh, grip with new uh, learning methods. 
So when he got older, I remember I did uh, a class from Celia Trickman, for example. Um, so he was still learned in quite old methods. So it was not before I bought We, I really felt like the foundation was much, much better. With him, I uh, went on Silva Trickman's classes from he was a puppy and did her foundation class as well as the puppy class and continued. And also, I think during, in Europe, it was also, uh, it was more available with the foundation work at that time in 2015. Yeah, of course, this developed also much. How is it to start agility as a young girl? It was boring. <laughs> it was uh, only only old people around. Um, it was hard to find someone to train with and someone what that was that passion that I was. Um, and in the middle of that, we moved, as I said. So it was quite hard to find someone to on my age to train with and. Um, so it was quite boring not having any friends in in agility. So I was, uh, it, it took some time. I was quite old until I found someone that shared my uh, passion about agility on in my age. I understand. And to see it from the emotional side, maybe, did you ever felt some pressure on you because your mom and your dad, they also run agility? No, no, I didn't do that because they were not in like a big, big level. Uh, so I didn't feel any pressure other than uh, that I was inspired to, to run agility. Yeah. And how it went then after you got we? Okay, I got we. Then everything started. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I went on... Uh, many Sylvia Trickman's classes, as I said. So, uh, and when he was uh, 18 months, we uh, went to Switzerland actually to do his debut. Uh, but I had broke my ankle. So oh. he ran with the, uh, I, I was standing still or ran with other people. And he was, he was such a easy learner. He took things really easy and learned really quick and really had like a talent of reading the course uh, but on the other hand he was quite crazy and always ran full speed so uh, but in the beginning and that age from 18 months until he was two he was really uh, just doing what i wanted him to do but during after those uh, first four months in competition, I really saw that he gained some confidence and uh, thought that he could read the courses himself. So after he went from grade one to grade three uh, in two months. So it oh, wow. was, yeah, he was quite he fast. Was, yeah. yeah, really, really fast. So and then I think every dog has like this learning curve that uh, they they start to understand and they help help us a bit and then they think they understand more than they do so you got li like this drop uh, where you are in a place where the dogs are uh, think they are better than you somehow and he also did that when he turned two two and we came to grade three uh, and he started to think that oh well I just have to take this jump or have to take this tunnel uh, so it was some time there where we uh, had some discussions uh, so he was uh, then two and a half when he qualified for his first uh, world championship uh, and then he ran uh, that uh, cha world championship in 2017 uh, ran his first run uh, clean, so that was quite cool with a um, two and a half, almost three year old uh, dog. Um, so he placed, I think he placed uh, eighth 
eighth or seventh or something in the jumping at that world championship. And uh, then we competed European Open, of course. And in 2018, he won one of the, or the jumping run at the world championship. How was this feeling? Oh, it's so hard to explain, I think. I, I run agility for the, the, the feeling, the feeling of flow and rush you get when the teamwork is, it, it just feels easy to run. Uh, that's what I run for. So I'm not really uh, thinking about results. Of course, the, it's fun to get some results, but I think this feeling and the rush is really, really, really much more important. So that was the feeling I had after that run. I was so high on adrenaline because everything was just perfect. And it was, it's a really, really, I don't think you experienced perfect runs many, many, many times because it's always something. And that feeling was really good. So I didn't look at the results actually when we came. Um, or was done with the run. I just walked out and rewarded him and was happy with that. And people started to talk about uh, the results. And I, I didn't want to hear it because if it was many dogs after us, so everything can change and you can't do anything about the competitors. You can only do uh, your best. And we had done our best. So it was nothing to talk about. So when the... Um, when the competition was over, it was quite cool to stand there with one of your biggest idols, with uh, Silas. So it was quite cool. And the feeling then was also quite a rush. But I think the, the feeling after the run is, was bigger than when knowing that you was first, actually. Wow, nice to hear this. Really nice. And 2019, you won also gold in both Nordic championships. Yes, we uh, won gold in the Nordic championships and the Norwegian championship that year. Um, so uh, we has never uh, been like the safest dog because he's a bit crazy and it's super fast that it drops a bar and... Uh, so I didn't think that the Nordic Championship was a competition for us. I like more the ones that this depending on one or two runs. In the Nordic Championship, you have to deliver three, three runs that they calculate together. Uh, uh, so um, I was not even thinking about it. And in the first run, he got a, con got a contact fault. So he already had five faults. So he wasn't on the top of the list. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really cool to... It's always, co always cool to like go into the last run uh, or a final and then deliver a clean run. Yeah. So it was cool. And you have the three runs on one day. No, you have, it's also team competition. Okay. So, and it, it was just changed how the setup was, but, but it's, you have one team run. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was one team run on Saturday and two individual, and then one team run on Sunday and one individual, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about agility in Norway. How is it there when you can compare it to other countries around you? I think it's Norway is a big country, so it can you have to travel a lot to compete. Um, I also think uh, we have developed a lot the last few years, but um, I think always we are a little after in like a new obstacles and uh, and the course designs but uh, of course now we have uh, more international judges like for example Jan Egil that is um, uh, that is um, 
helping Norway to develop in course designs and safety for the dogs and so on. So I think we're getting there. And I also think that people, uh, there, there's a lot more people doing agility now, and that also makes the level higher. So I think we are developing really fast now. I think Norway will have uh, really, really good dogs at the next world championship or at least in like three, four years. I think we will be much, much bigger. And so how are the qualification rules in Norway? Mm, those changed in 2018. It was the first year we only have one weekend with qualifications okay so then we run eight runs in one weekend and uh, the best one wins so then you are counting the six six best results from from that weekend and they calculate it and it is also from 20 yeah 2018 uh, they also because you have to uh, like run clean or at least almost um to to get qualified or to get many points but uh, they also changed it so that uh, faster dogs get more points so that oh. uh, you can for example get one bar uh, but also get points because you are faster than the winner oh wow so they rewards you uh, if you're faster so you lose some points because of your fault, and then you can gain some if you are faster than the winner. But it's all focused on this weekend. Everything is about this weekend. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> so there's quite pressure on you. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're competing the world or um, yeah, a championship. Yes, you have How to do deliver them. How do you prepare yourself for the special weekends with a lot of pressure? Uh, do you mean like uh, myself or uh, yes. the dogs? Myself, I, as I said, I, I, I don't think much about the results normally, but the um, tryouts is one of the weekends that I find hard because if you don't deliver there, you will not be able to have a chance in the championships. So if if I don't do uh, very well in a championship, it's fine because you're already there and you get yeah. the experience. But if you don't deliver anything on the tryouts, you're not even qualified. So that's the hardest uh, part, I think. But I don't, I try to not think about it. So I just think about each run as individual and do not want to think about the results uh, during the weekend just that the next run has to be or i have to do everything i can in that run so i focus a lot on on my own focus because i can in small competitions i can get like unfocused and just like yeah yeah it doesn't matter <laughs> so i really try to tell myself that now is important and you have to do your job my job is to um, use the right uh, the correct verbals use them in our timing time them very well and look at my dog for example so that i don't lose him and other than that i can't do do you see it like in your classes or when you go for seminars, that the timing of the verbal cues are often not good timed? Yes. Yes, I think uh, it's quite normal that the cues, and I also are late with my cues. Um, I think that's really normal. And especially in beginners, of course. And then I think people are getting better um, as more they train. But yes, I think people are a bit late. I think uh, the dogs, and it also depends on if you have a small dog, medium dog, or large dog. I think the large dogs need um, the information much, much earlier because they're jumping. The strides are much bigger. With a small dog, they have like a lot of uh, um, steps to adjust if they get late cues. But with a bigger dog, they don't have any like maybe one step 
to adjust and that's that's hard for them with in full speed so i really think uh, late use are really normal yes and you agree then also that because of the late timing a lot of mistakes can happen in the curse yeah. yes a lot of mistakes but um most important uh injuries hmm. so i think that's uh, you have to think about if the dog don't get any uh, the the uh, tight turn cue in correct time it would not be able to adjust their step steps to collect and then if they jump in extension uh, and they will understand in the jump oh well we are going that way and then they try and then it can maybe slip or anything so i think at least um for that it's really important if the dog if you're too late and the dog takes a tunnel it takes a tunnel it's only a dq so it doesn't matter but i think it's really important for because of injuries yes and like you told before also you sometimes have to handle it with the timing so what are you doing for it to get there better oh i think um the timing i think it's almost all about uh, course walking mm -hmm. because i i really try to time my uh, cues already on the course walk so when I'm trying to see where is the dog now when I try to or I always mumble or say my cues when I course walk so that the cues are early and then I just have to when I run I just have to uh, remember it like you remember the course so yeah. it, it, it will just come but of course I'm all, also often late but that's how it is <laughs> yeah like it's natural because we are not robots or <laughs> yes <laughs> and 2021 was also some successful year for you yes it was um the only championship we had uh was um the tryouts of course and then we had the nordic championship so the tryouts went uh, really well um Yes, we had quite a lot of good runs. Um, one mistake from getting any... We only got one clean run in the Nor uh, Norwegian Championship and we have to have two, two. So I got one little mistake in the jumping run there. But uh, the tryout was really good. And at the no um, Nordic Championship, we also ran... I think that's our best... Uh, championship uh, for now actually we ran clean runs after clean runs after clean runs and I just felt unstoppable <laughs> so I think we had four clean runs and and yes and then we won the gold medal in team competition yeah so that really was nice that was really cool yes the team was really great and unfortunately We got some, we were both tired in the end and the individual final. And we uh, all had, like I said earlier, it's three runs. So we had a bar in the second run. So I all, or in the final, I knew that I had those five faults. And you, yeah, almost always have to run th three clean runs to get the podium. Yeah, so but still something to be proud of. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of it. And I'm really happy. As I said, I really run for the flow and the rush. And we got that in every run, um, except the last one. So that was quite fun. And after we, you got Chi Chi. Yes, I have Chi and he's a son after we. Ah, okay. So that was, uh, I wouldn't was not supposed to have uh, another dog at all but I couldn't say no and uh, Key my first own dog got sick and um, developed some pain in the back um, like a prolapse is it mm -hmm. in English yes, yes. Uh, so he had a lot of pain and the veterinarians didn't know what to do and the painkillers didn't work 
So he moved to my dad so he can, uh, because he was really attacking we because he had some, a, lot of, a lot of pain. So at that point, I only had we when she was born. So he was living with my, um, she lives, he still lives with my sister. So I couldn't say no to Chi. And I think he was about 14 weeks old, 15 weeks old, when he ran down the stairs outside and broke his foot. Oh. So that was not good at all. So he, um, yeah, I think that, that's where everything started. Um, his his bad journey. He has not had a good journey at all. So it took like a half a year until he was good, and then we. I was a bit scared to start agility because he was he's super super crazy. He's much faster than we, and uh, he really, really had big potential in agility. Uh, and then, I think. I, I don't know, but I think he developed a, a bad pattern when he walks because of the the foot that he broke. And I also uh, jumped him on in agility on very, very low heights, very long, because I was so afraid of building it up. So when I first started to build up the jumps, he uh, started to have problems jumping. And I only thought that it was about experience so i didn't do anything about it and then the problem just got bigger uh, especially when we moved up to full height uh, so i started my first uh, jumping technique class class with him and uh, hoped that it will be better so after we have uh, did i think we did three jumping technique classes and uh, went back to in my tr foundation training a lot of times and th the problem didn't get away uh, even in the jumping techniques he had big problems on finding the correct uh, takeoff spots and is his jumping he really wants to run fast and he's not looking forward he's always looking often looking at me or the next obstacle so he yeah he really has bad jumping technique and then the last last year I decided that I will give him one last chance uh, so we tried to train the jumping technique but with stress so I was always running and stressing him and it got a bit better so he could maybe jump 35 uh, last summer but as soon it was 40 centimeters the problem was there okay. so then I decided that I would retire him because it was not fair because he um, hurt himself so yes so he's now retired and he's training a little bit but now in the winter he broke uh, broke his toe as well as oh I my said, god! He, he's a crazy one. <laughs> he yeah. Jumped after his toy, and then yes. So I don't think he would do a lot of agility anymore. I think he will be, yeah, family dog. And was it hard for you to get to the point where you say, okay, his health is more important than agility, and I will retire him? I don't think it was hard because I have been thinking about this since he was two mm. and last year he was four so it has been one and a half two years thinking of it so and I have not competed a lot because I wanted to fix this and then it has been a lot back and forth so I think it was a relief uh, to finally just say okay but he is better without agility so it was actually quite good because it was so stressing for me in training I was so afraid every time I trained him my heart just stops every time he jumped so I, I couldn't breathe so for me it was actually the opposite I think it was a relief okay how did you develop as you as trainer to train with chi 
would you say that you develop much more because you try a lot of different things out with him? Yes, I yes, absolutely. I normally say that we has been the dog that really uh, teach me to do handling and do things in speed. But he was such an easy easy dog, so he didn't learn me quite a lot uh, in training. But she has really he has been hard in everything because he had so much stress in everything and so so much power um so yes he has really developed me a lot like a trainer and as i said i did my first jumping technique class with him i will never ever have a puppy again uh, or young dad that will not do jumping technique so yes i i have developed a lot and in running context training as well, he was such a training uh, addict uh, so that he didn't care if he got rewards or not. So uh, when looking back at it, he actually should have just, I should stop the training when he was uh, doing a mistake because when he got the chance to do it again, he was just, just as happy. <laughs> so he has really developed me a lot as a trainer. Take us a little bit more into your trainings how do you train now at the moment how do your trainings look like at the moment i have jets uh so he is uh, uh, a young dog he's now 18 months or one and a half year so i do with him i do a lot more training than with the older ones uh because we need to bu build up his foundation work um so with him, I think I do, many people ask me that, how much do you train? So with Jet, I think one to three days a week. And it can be like about three different uh, themes, things that I do. So maybe some foundation with the low speed and just thinking, learning pushes or ins or turns in low speed for example and then something with more impact for example weaves or uh, running contact seesaw or something like that and then I try to do once a week a little combination uh, and that's with we the training is a bit different he is I think I really want to train him as little as possible to save his body so he is running once a week course or combination to prepare for the um, tryouts and then one session with for example uh, or details with for example jumping technique or working on things that he need to develop okay and how do you train others so where's your focus there that changed a lot, but I have regular groups that is training with me. So with them, I uh, normally build a course and we uh, uh, run it or do it in small little parts. And they get to choose if they want to focus on something foundation work. Um, and I try to have like one theme in each course so maybe discrimination or layering or independent jumps or focus on the weaves or anything in each course and then i have a group with uh, younger dogs and there we do uh, more or only foundation work so then we for example focus on independent jump in the beginning tunnels and then pushes and then ins so it depends a little and do you have a own trainings hall or some trainings place outside? Uh, yes, almost. My father has uh, a place and he has had an outdoor uh, field uh, in many, many years. So that's where I've been, I have been training um, the, the, yeah, since, since I got key. But in the winter, it has been really hard because we don't have any, we don't have many halls in Norway and most of them are private mm. so they don't accept many people training there so it has been on and off 
uh, if it has been possible to train in the winter or not. So with we, the first years he trained maybe once every second week because it was super hard to uh, get to a place to train. Uh, but last winter, uh, my dad built a hall. So now wow. we have an indoor. Yes, it's it's only plastic hall, so it's super super cold. <laughs> uh, and it's really cold in Norway so but it's it's working it's no snow and it's no wind yeah. so it works so that's where I have my classes nice and you have classes every day because you are economically living of it I'm living of it but not I don't have every day no I have uh, uh, once maybe two to three days a week And then the weekends. Okay. So I travel a lot uh, to have seminars in the weekends. So, but it's, yeah, it's, it's um, too few uh, weekends in the year. <laughs> so it's hard to find a balance between some resting time, competing own dogs and having seminars in the weekend. So, yes. And I also have had... Uh, some online classes not the last year but or yes I have had with the Jets but not with feedback that also has been something yes so not every day no not the teaching can you describe yourself as a seminar leader how I am or yes yes <sighs> I feel I feel I'm uh, I'm try to be uh, motivation uh, motivate people and positive uh, to help uh, them get the feeling of mastery but I also want them to get challenged uh, when they come to me for training so I try to find uh, a balance there so that they can both develop and feel uh, feel good after the training uh yes so i i also try to give them feedback that is not only working there but also in the future so i try to explain uh why we are doing the change that we are doing so that they can bring it along later on as well do you think it's important that the people are understanding what the problem Yes. Yes, I really think it's important because then they can change uh, or train on the problem. Uh, of course, we can normally every problem can be fixed by handling, but I think that's only the quick fix. So I, uh, people do always really want to to make it there. <laughs> So I say that we can fix it with handling, but also wants to explain them how they can fix it with the training so that they can develop. Can you give one example for it? Oh, that was that one was hard. Um, ooh, for example, if you have a hard in, for example, You can uh, help them with uh, either a Japanese turn or you can uh, call the dog and then send to the jump. But then I don't un think the dog understands the task. Uh, so I really want them to understand that the inside cue, the trail cue is inside and jump. So that you don't have to be there and send the dog to the jump And then you don't make the blind cross after if you want. So that's an example. Yeah, nice. And which problem you see the most on seminars? Maybe also some problems from different dogs, are, but they are repeating. I think obstacle focus. That's the biggest, uh, biggest problem. I think many people just uh, teach the dog every task with just sending the dog to the task every time. And then when the dog is a little bit uh, ahead from the handler, you don't have the hand to push, for example, for uh, an outside. 
and then the dog doesn't understand. How do you train this, the obstacle focus? I, I really like them to understand the, um, the verbals. And I start with, for example, Jet, I started to teach him uh, different cues on different objects uh, when he was a puppy. For example, go to his bed and lay down. And then I hold him and let him look at the bed before he can go there. So that he don't look at me, but look at the, um, the carpet before he goes. And then you can uh, send from different angles and with um, more distance to these puppy tricks. And then I do the same with uh, the agility. I really want them to, if I, I give them the cue for something, I really want them to look where to go and then go there so that they, I can see that they understand the task. And if they're not, if they're just looking at me, I don't understand if they have understand it or not and if they are guessing if i just let them go i think they are guessing most of the time so i really like them to look where to go yes. how much time you spend for the like foundation and this basic work a lot uh in puppy i i because she broke his foot uh i think his training was a little different but with we and Jet, uh, it was a lot of tricks and working on the focus on objects and sending them away from me to the toy, for example, or other objects. So I work a lot of that uh, when they are puppies. And then I really do a lot of work on the foundation. I think maybe I'm, I am really bad at training combinations and put things together. So that's always a problem with my dogs when I want them to develop. So I really maybe use too much time on the small, small details. And maybe not because you have your success. So maybe it's fine. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Do you make something beside agility with your dogs? Yes, I think would we, as I said, train one to two times a week agility. And um, I think that's not enough for agility dog. I think they're, it's so high risk of injuries, so they have to be in good condition. So I really try to uh, do strength training with them several times a week. They normally swim a lot in the summer. And in the winter, um, we swim indoor. Uh, in swimming hall. Oh, With wow. Them. Yes, it's quite cool, actually. And they love swimming. So then I can do it like once once a week. Uh, it's also a really good thing, I think, because it's a lot of ice, especially this winter. We have snow, rain, snow, rain, snow, rain. So it's almost impossible or really high risk on taking them for walks. So, yeah, swimming. And then when the weather is, or the, it's not slippery, we walk a lot in the forest. So, they, so body condition is important for you. Yes. Yes, really, really. Both uh, coordination training, walking in forest, the strength training. Yes, that's, that's really important. And this developed also over the years that you start to do this all? Yes, yes, that has been developing a lot. I don't think I did that much with um, uh, my dogs when I was younger. Uh, I actually, I started on when I was going to school. I had like, there is a line here where you can have dogs with you on the school and teach the dogs on the school. So I did that with Key. So that's, I think that's when it started we, I, with, training a lot more training tricks and obedience and and stuff like that uh, isn't some strength uh, training that's when it started and uh, then i i'm still learning about it so i think uh, the more you know the more you know it's important for them to be in good condition what kind of coordination training you are making with your dogs Oh, it can be Cavaletti or some different fit boss. 
uh, or it can just be, for example, easy, easy um, obedience tricks that lie down, stand with locked legs, for example, so they can't move it. So it's not like super hard, but uh, backing up on things, for example, yes. For your students in your classes, when you see some problems on a jump or on some obstacle, do you also give some homework for like coordination or strength? I can recommend them to do easy stuff, but I am not educated in, I'm not like a physiotherapist or anything. And I, I am still learning in the jumping technique. So I can give them easy, easy tasks so that I'm not afraid that they will do wrong. But otherwise, I will just um, uh, uh, say that it's they would. I would recommend them to take like a, a class or uh, take some time with the fun, um, uh, a physiotherapist or anything to learn how their dog has uh, to develop. Yes, that's also nice because. Um... I think not a lot of trainers, not only in agility, like also in other kind of sports, are recommend this. They just focus on their technique or on the speed, but not like on the global dog. So that's nice. Yes, I really don't think I can help them with everything. So yes, I, I really think it's important for them to take contact with, with people that know this stuff better than me. Really good. So, you know, the time is running. Wow, we are yes. nearly talking an hour. <laughs> But in the end, we have always some short questions and short answers. Are you ready for it? Yes, I'll try. <laughs> Agility is for me. The biggest inspiration. Favorite obstacle in agility. Oh, hard one. I think we or Slavo, yes. My dogs are for me. They are everything. The most important sentence I have ever heard in training. I think it has to be you always win. Either you win or you learn. Agility in Norway will increase in the next five years. Yes. What I would like to say to the agility community. I would like to say have fun and focus on uh, educating the dog and not expect them to know anything they don't know. Really nice ending sentence. Thank you again for your time and have a nice evening. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.